Ashley Brock reading Nora Roberts' book, Rising Tides, Chapter 8. Seth kept watch from them. His excuse for being in the front yard as the shadows grew long was the dogs. Not that it was an excuse exactly, he thought. He was trying to teach Foolish not just to chase the, bra the battered, well-chewed tennis ball, but to bring it back the way Simon did. Trouble was, the Foolish would race back to you with the ball, then expect you to play tug of war for it. Not that Seth minded. He had a supply of balls and sticks and an old hunk of rope that Ethan had given him. He could toss and tug as long as the dogs were willing to run, which was, as far as he could tell, just about forever. But while he played with the dogs, he kept his ears tuned for the sound of an approaching car. He knew they were on their way home because Cam had called from the plane, which was just about the coolest thing Seth could think of. Couldn't wait to tell Danny and Will how he talked to Cam while Cam had been flying over the Atlantic Ocean. He already looked up Italy in the Atlas and found Rome. Had traced his finger back and forth, back and forth across the wide ocean from Rome to the Chesapeake Bay to the little smudge of Maryland's eastern shore that was St. Christopher's. For a little while, he'd been afraid they wouldn't come back. He imagined Cam calling, saying they decided to stay over there so he could race again. He knew Cam had lived all over the place, racing boats and cars and mo motorcycles. Ray had told him all about it. There was a thick scrapbook in the den that was filled with all kinds of newspaper, magazine pictures, and articles about how many races Cam had won how many women he fooled around with he knew that cam had won this big deal race in his hydrophone which seth wished he could ride in just once right before ray had run into the telephone pole and died full but finally tracked him down in monte carlo seth had found that place in the atlas too it didn't look at all that much bigger than st chris but they had a palace there and fancy casinos and even a prince Cam had come home in time to see Ray die. Seth knew he hadn't planned to stay very long, but he had stayed. After they had sort of a fight, he told Seth he wasn't going anywhere, that they were stuck with each other and he was staying put. Still, that was before he'd gotten married and everything, before he'd gone back to Italy, before Seth had started to worry that both Cam and Anna would forget about him and the promises they made. But they hadn't. They were coming back. He didn't want them to know he was waiting for them, or that he was excited that they would be home any minute, but he was. He couldn't understand why he was all pumped up about it. They'd only been gone a couple of weeks, and Cam was a pain in the ass most of the time anyway. Once Anna was living there, everybody would say how he had to watch his language because there was a woman in the house. Part of him worried that Anna would change things. Even though she was his caseworker, she might get tired of having a kid around. She had the power to send him away. More power now, he thought, because she was... Doing it with Cam all the time, he reminded himself that she played it straight with him from the minute she pulled him out of class and sat down with him in the school cafeteria to talk. But working on a case and living in the same house with the, that case was different, wasn't it? And maybe just maybe she played straight with him. She'd be nice to him because she liked having Cam poke at her. She wanted to get married to him. Now that she was, she wouldn't have to be nice anymore. She could even write on one of her reports that he'd be better off somewhere else. Well... He was going to watch, and he was going to see. He had still run, and things get sticky. Though the idea of running made his stomach hurt in a way it had never done before. He wanted to be here. He wanted to run in the yard, throw sticks to the dogs, crawl out of bed when it's still dark, and eat breakfast with Ethan, and go out on the water crabbing to work in the boatyard, or go down to Danny and Will's to eat real food whenever he was hungry, and sleep in a bed that didn't smell like somebody else's sweat. Red promised him all of that, and though Seth had never trusted anyone, he trusted Ray. Maybe Ray had been his father, maybe he hadn't. But Seth knew he paid Gloria a lot of money. He thought of her as Gloria now, and not as his mother. It helped to add more distance. Now Ray was dead, but he made each of his sons promise to keep Seth in the house by the water. Seth figured they'd probably hadn't liked the idea, but they promised anyway. He discovered that the Quinn keep, Quinns keep their word. It was a new and wonderful concept to him, a promise kept. They broke, and now he knew it would hurt more than anything had hurt him before. So he waited. When he heard the car, not quite tame, roar of the Corvette, his stomach jittered with excitement and nerves. Simon wolfed twice in greeting, but Foolish sat up, <laughs> did a wild, half-terrified barking. When the sleek white car pulled into the drive, both darks raced toward it, tails wagging, waving like flags. That stuck hands that had gone sweaty in his pockets and strolled over cautiously. Hi, Anna shot him a brilliant smile. Seth could see why Cam had gone for her, all right. He himself had sketched her face a number of times in secret. He liked to draw above all else. His fledging, fledging artist's eye appreciated the sheer beauty of the, that face. The dark almond-shaped eyes, the clear pale gold skin, the full mouth, and the exotic hand of cheekbones. Her hair was windblown, a dark curly mass. Her wedding ring still glinting, diamonds and gold. She stepped out of the car and caught him, unprepared, in a laughing, bone-crushing hug. 
What a terrific welcoming party! Though the embrace had surprised him and wanting to linger there, he looked from. I was just out fooling with the dogs. He looked over at Cam. Shot. Hey, hey, good. Lean and dark and just a little dangerous to the eye. Cam moved forward his link from the low riding car. His grin was quicker than Ethan's sharp. Qu quicker than Ethan's, sharper than Phillips. Just in time to hold me unload. Yeah, sure. Seth glanced up, noticed small mountain luggage. Start to the roof. You didn't take all that crap with you. We picked up some Italian. We picked up some Italian crap while we were there. I couldn't stop myself. Then I said, well, uh, we had to buy another suitcase. Two. Graham corrected. One. One's just a tote. It doesn't count. Okay. Cam popped the trunk, pulled out a generous dark green suitcase. You carry the one that doesn't count. Putting your bride to work already. Philip crossed to the car, wide two dolls. I'll take that, ain't I? He, he said and kissed her with an enthusiasm that had Seth rolling his eyes at Cam. Turn her loose, Phil. He just said mildly. I hate for Cam to have to kill you before he even gets in the house. Welcome home. He added and smiled when Anna turned to give him an enthusiastic kiss that Philip had given her. It's good to be home. <laughs> the tote, it turned out, contained gifts, which Anna immediately began to dispense, along with stories of each one. Seth only stared down at the bright blue and white shocker shirt she'd given him. No one had ever gone on a trip and bought him back a present. The fact was, if he thought about it, he could count the gifts he'd been given, something for nothing, on the fingers of one hand. Soccer's big over in Europe, Anna told him. They call it football, but it's not like our football. She dug deeper, pulled out an oversized book with a glossy cover. And I thought you might like this. It's not as quite as seeing the paintings. It really grabs you by the throat to see them in person. But you'll get the idea. The book was full of paintings, glorious colors, and shapes that dazzled his eyes. An art book. She remembered that he liked to draw, and I thought of him. It's cool, he muttered, because he couldn't trust his voice. She wanted to buy everybody's shoes. Cam commented. I had to stop her. So I only bought myself a half a dozen pair. I thought it was four. <laughs> She's about six. I stuck two by you. Philip, I stumbled across Margulius. I could have wept. Armani. <laughs> she sighed lustily. Oh, yeah. Now I'm going to cry. You can sob over fashion later, Kendall. I'm starving. Grace was here. Says want to try on a shirt right away, but thought it would be too lame. She cleaned everything, made us wash up in the bay, and she fried chicken. Grace. Grace made fried chicken. And potato soup. There's no place like home. Came out and headed for the kitchen. Seth waited a few seconds to fall. I guess I could eat another piece. He said casually. Get in line. Can't put the platter and bowl out of the fridge. Don't they give you stuff to eat on the plane? That was then. This is now. Cam heaped a plate with food and leaned back against the counter. Kid looked tan and healthy. He noted the eyes were still weary, but his face had lost that rabbit about to run look. He wondered if it would surprise Seth as much as it had himself to know he'd missed the smart mouth rat. So. How's it been going? Okay, school's done, and I've been helping Ethan out on the boat a lot. Pays me slaves' wages there and at the boatyard. Anna's gonna want to know what you got on your report card. Ace, Seth muttered around a mouthful of drums. Can't you? Oh, yeah. So what? She's gonna love that. Wanna make more points with her? Seth jerked a shoulder, kid there in his eyes as he considered what he would be asked to do to please the woman of the house. Maybe. Put that soccer shirt on. Took her damn near half an hour to pick out the right one. Major points if you wear it the same night she gives it to you. Yeah? As easy as that, Seth thought and relaxing again. I guess I could give her a thrill. He really liked this shirt, Anna said as she meticulously tucked away the contents of one suitcase. In the book. I was so glad we thought of the book. Yeah, he liked them. Cam figured the next day, even next year, was soon enough to unpack. Besides, he liked stretching out on the bed, watching her, watching his wife. He thought it was an odd little thrill for us around the room. He didn't freeze up when I hugged him. That's a good sign. And his interaction with Ethan and Philip is easier, more natural, than it was even a couple of weeks ago. He was anxious to see you again. He's feeling a little threatened by me. Changes the dy dynamics around here just at the point where he was getting used to how things work. So he's waiting, and he's watching for all what'll happen next. But that's good. It means he considers this his home. I'm the intruder, Miss Spinelli. She turned her head or she That's Mrs. Quindy, you buster. <laughs> Why don't you turn off the social worker until Monday? Can't. She slipped one of her new shoes out of his back and nearly cooed at it in delight. The social worker is very pleased with the status of this particular case. And Mrs. Quinn, the brand new sister-in-law, is determined with such trust. And maybe even his affection. <laughs> she slipped the shoe back into the bag. Wonder how long she should wait before asking Cam to customize the closet. She knew just what she had in mind. And he was good with his hands, considering. Considering. She studied him. Very. 
very good with his hands. I suppose. I guess I could finish unpacking tomorrow. He smiles slowly. I suppose you could. I feel guilty about it. Grace is this place so spotless. Why don't you come over here? We'll work on that guilt. Why don't I? Just toss the shoe over her shoulder and with a laugh, jumped him. She's coming along. Cam studied the boat. It was barely seven in the morning, but his internal clock was still set to roam. Since he wakened early, he had seen the point. He had seen the point and letting his brother sleep the day away. So the Quinn stood under the hard, bright lights of the boatyard, contemplating the jaw at hand. Seth mimicking their stance, hands in pockets, legs spread and braced, a face somber. It would be the first time the four of them had worked on the boat together. He was wildly thrilled. I figured you could start bell decks, Ethan began. Ethan began. Philip estimates 400 hours to finish the cabin. Camp snorted. I can do it in less. Doing it right, Philip put in, is more important than doing it fast. I can do it fast and right. The client have this baby under sale and gala stocked with champagne and caviar in less than 400 hours. He did not. Since Cam had come through with another client, he wanted a sport fishing boat. He nearly hoped that was true. Then let's get to work. And work kept his mind off things. His mind had no business being on. The rain had to be focused to use the lathe. If you were fond of your hands, Ethan turned the wood slowly, carefully, forming the mask. Ear protectors turned the, uh, turned the hum of the motor and the hot rock blasting from the radio into a muffled echo. He imagined there was a conversation going on behind him, too. In the occupation, occasional rip curse. He could smell the sweet scent of wood, the sting of expedite. The stench of tar used to coat bolts. Years ago, three of them had built his work boat. She wasn't fancy, and he couldn't claim she had a pretty face, but she was sound, and she was game. They built a skipjack as well, because he'd been determined to dredge oysters in a traditional craft. Now the oysters were nearly gone, and his boat joined the other handful in the bay, pulling in extra money during the summer by giving tours. He rented it to Jim's brother during tour series, because it helped them both, and was a practical thing to do. But it bothered him some to see the fine old vessel used that way, just as it bothered him some that no other people lived in slept in the house that was his but when push came to show money mattered Seth's laugh snuck through his ear protectors reminded him why it mattered now more than ever when his hands cramped from the work he turned off the lathe to give them a rest noise filled his ears when he took off the protectors he heard the pounding of came hammer echoing from bolo decks Seth was coating the centerboard with rust oleum so the steel plate gleamed with wet philip had the nastier job of soaking the inside of the centerboard case with crayer Christianite was good old growth red cinder, which should discourage any marine borers, but they decided not to take chances. A boat by Quinn was built to last. He felt a stir of pride watching him. He could almost imagine his father standing beside him, big hands fisted on his hips. Why oh, That makes a picture, Ray right, said. So that kind. Your mother and I love to study. We had plenty of them, but put aside to take out and look over once while y'all grew up and went off your own way. We never really had the chance because she left first. I still miss her. I know you do. She was the glue that kept all of us together, but she did a good job of it, Ethan. You're still stuck. I guess I'd have died without her, without you, without them. No, Ray laid a hand on Ethan's shoulder, shook his head. You're always strong heart and mind. You came out the other side of a hell as but as much because what's inside you is what we did. You should remember that more often. Just look at Seth. He handles things differently than you do, but he's got a lot of the same qualities inside him. He cares deeper than he wants to. He thinks deeper than he lets on, and he wants to go deeper than he'll admit even to himself. I see you and him. It was the first time he didn't allow himself to say it, even to himself. I don't know how to feel about it. Funny. I see each one of you and him. The eye of the beholder, Ethan. Then he gave Ethan a quick slap on the back. That's a damn fine boat coming along there. Your mother would have gotten a kick out of this. Quinn's build to last. Ethan murmured. Who are you talking to? Seth demanded. Ethan Blake felt his head go light. Full of thoughts. Then his strands had come. What? He pushed a hand up his forehead into his hair, knocking his cap at. What? Man, you look weird, said Cox. How come you're standing here talking to yourself? I was asleep on my feet. He put thinking, he said, just thinking out loud. Suddenly, a noise and smell seemed to roar into his dizzy I need some air. He muttered and hurried out through the cargo doors. 
Weird. So I said again. Started, started to say something. Philip then was distracted as Anna came through the front door, carrying an enormous pamper. Anybody interested in lunch? Yeah. Always interested. Seth made a be like, did you bring the chicken? What's left of it? She told him. And ham sandwiches thick as bricks. There's a cooler of iced tea in the car. Why don't you go haul it in? My hero. Philip said, wiping his hands on his knees for reliving her of the hamper. Hey, Cam. There's a gorgeous woman out here with food. The hammering stopped instantly. Seconds later, Cam's head popped up. The cabin. My woman. I get first dibs of the food. There's plenty to go around. Grace isn't the only one who can put meals together for a bunch of hungry men. <sighs> Though her fried chicken's a gift from the gods. <laughs> She's got away with it. Phil agreed. He, he set the hamper down on a makeshift table fashioned out of a sheet of plywood laid over two sawhorses. horses. She cooked for Ethan regularly when you two were away. He dug out. Of I get the feeling something's happening there. Happening where? Cam wanted to know as he jumped down to explore the hamper. Was Ethan and Grace? No shit. <laughs> mm-hmm. First bite made Philip close his eyes in pleasure. He might have preferred French cuisine served on fine china, but he couldn't appreciate a well-built sandwich balanced on a paper plate. My deathless observation skills have honed in on certain signs. He watches her when she's not looking. She watches him when he's not looking. And I got some interesting gossip from Marshall Tuttle. She works now at the pub with Grace. Explained to me, Anna. Shiny's had a security system and has a new policy that none of the waitresses are closed up at loan. Did something happen? And I said, yeah. Looked over to be certain Seth hadn't come back in. A few nights ago, some bastard came in after closing. Grace was alone. He put his hands on her. According to Marsha, would have done more, but it just so happened Ethan was outside. Interesting coincidence, if you ask me, when we were talking of our early to bed, early to rise brother. Anyway, he put some dents in the guy. He took another healthy bite. Cam thought I sent her fine bone Grace. I hope they were nice deep dents. I think we can assume the guy didn't walk off whistling. Of course, in typical Ethan style, he doesn't mention it, so I have to hear of it from Marsha over the fresh produce at the market Friday night. Was Grace hurt? Anna knew all too well what it was to be trapped, to be helpless, to face with what a certain kind of man would do to a woman or a child. No, must have shaken her up, but she's like Ethan there. Never mention it, but there were several long, silent looks between them yesterday, and after Ethan ran her home, he came back sizzling. <laughs> I remember Phil chuckled to himself, which for Ethan is some, saying something. Got him, got himself a couple beers and went out into the slope for an hour. Grace and Ethan came good. They'd fit. So, see, Seth come in and decided to give the topic rest. Where is Ethan anyway? He went outside. The grunt set, set the cooler down and nodded toward the cargo doors. He said he needed some air. I guess he did. He was standing there talking to himself. Through with the bounty set up diving into the hammer. Wait. He was like carrying a conversation with someone who wasn't there. He looked weird. Back at Cam's neck pickle. <laughs> so he moved casually. Dumb horribly. I could use some air myself. I'll just take him a sandwich. He saw Ethan standing out on the end of the pier. <sighs> staring out at the water. Sure, St. Christopher, with all its pretty houses and yours, was on either side. Ethan looked straight down, with a light chopped on us. Anna brought some food out. Ethan folded up his thoughts, glanced down at the plate. Nice of her. He ain't lucky with her cam. Don't I know it? What he was about to do made him a little nervous. But after that, but after all, he was a man who lived for risks. I still remember the first day I saw her. I was pissed off at the world. Dad was hardly buried. And everything I wanted seemed to be somewhere else. The kid had given me plenty of grief that morning. It occurred to me that the next part of my life wasn't going to be racing. It wasn't going to be in Europe. It was going to be right here. He gave up the most coming back here. It seemed like it at the time. Then Anna Spinelli walked across the yard while I was fixing the back steps. She gave me my second jolt of the day. Since the food was there, Cam seemed inclined to talk. He said, took up the plate, sat on the edge of the dock, and air it flew by. Saw it as it goes. Face like hers is bound to give a man the jolt. <laughs> yeah, and I was already feeling a little edgy. Not an hour before, I had this conversation with Dad. He was sitting in the back porch rocker. He did not. He always liked sitting there. I don't mean I remember him sitting there. I mean I saw him there. Just like I'm seeing you now. Slowly, Ethan turned his head, looked in the camera's eyes. He saw him, sitting in the rocker on the porch. Talked to him, too. He talked to me. Came shrugged, gazed out over the water. So I figured I'm a hallucination. 
It's stress, the worry, maybe the anger. I've got things to say to him, questions I want answered, so my mind puts them there. Only that's not what it was. He then stepped caref carefully onto a bogey. Onto a bogey ground. What do you figure it was? He was there, first time, and the other. Other times, yeah. The last was the morning before the wedding. He said he would be the last because I figured out what I needed to figure out from now. Cam rubbed his hands over his face. Had to let him go again. It was a little easier. I didn't get all the questions answered, but I guess the ones that mattered most were. He sighed. No better. Help himself to one of the chimps on Ethan's plate. Now, you either tell me I'm crazy, or do you know what I'm talking about? Thoughtfully, Ethan tore one of the sandwiches and half handed to share to Cam. When you follow the water, you get to know there's more things than you can see or touch. Mermaids and serpents. He smiled a little. Sailors know about them, whether they've ever seen them or not. I don't think you're crazy. Or are you going to tell me the rest? I've had some dreams. I thought they were dreams. He cracked himself. But lately, I've had a couple when I was awake. I guess I have answers, too. I guess I have questions, too. But I had a, I have a hard time pushing somebody into answers. It's good to hear his voice, to see his face. We didn't have enough time to really say goodbye before we died. Maybe that's part of it. It's not all of it. No, but I don't know what he wants me to do that I'm not doing. <laughs> I imagine he'll stick around until you figure it out. Can't fit in the sandwich, but amazingly content. So what does he think of the boat? He thinks it's a damn fine boat. He's right. Ethan said sandwich. Are we going to tell Phil about this? Nope, but I can't wait until it happens to him. What do you bet he'll think about heading to some fancy shrink? He'll want one with lots of initials after his name in an office on the right side of town. Her name. Ethan corrected him against my He'll want a good-looking female if he's going to lie down on a couch. It's a pretty day. He had to suddenly appreciate the warm breeze and the flash of sun. Uh, we've got another ten minutes to enjoy it, came to him. Then your ass goes back to work. Yeah. Yeah. Your wife makes a damn good sandwich. He was it. How do you think she'll do that sandwich? Came considered. Like the image. Let's go talk her into letting us find out. End of chapter eight.